so um, welcome. I am Ricardo Romo, and I'm happy to be here with you all. I'll, uh, I'll, Mr. Dr. Alonso, who is going to be presenting, is a native of the Lower Rio, Rio Grande Valley. Uh, he's an associate professor of um, at Department of History, Texas A&M. His research, if you've read his other, you know, some of his books, include Spanish colonization, land tenure, economic history in Northeast Mexico and Texas from the colonial period to the 20th century. Uh, his current manuscript uh, examines the region's socioeconomic linkage since Spanish settlement. His book, Tejano Legacy, Rancheros and Settlers in South Texas, 1734 to 1900, was published by the University of New, Me New Mexico Press. So we are going forward and we'll leave some uh, 10 minutes for questions. They'll be thinking of what you might ask and we'll come back to you all in about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, talk about this uh, very interesting uh, topic on the history of uh, what is now uh, Northeast Mexico, including uh, South Texas, uh, the lower valley of Texas. Uh, the uh, Spaniards, when they came to the New World, uh, they quickly wanted to uh, find uh, riches and, of course, uh, once they uh, went into Mexico, uh, they um, uh, found Montezuma and the Aztecs and all the gold and silver that they had, among other things. Uh, the Spaniards uh, very quickly uh, became excited about finding more mineral riches. Uh, uh, everyone immediately thought they could all get rich quickly, um, as everyone knows in the history of of uh, gold and silver, that, that happens. Uh, a few people do get extremely rich, uh, but many others uh, do not, most others do not. Uh, certainly most of the miners uh, uh, made just very little money. Uh, but the uh, uh, appetite got so big that they started going all over Mexico, moving in different directions. And in 1546, they find this incredible bonanza, silver bonanza, at a place called Zacatecas to the northwest of Mexico City. And that began the movement north, uh, northeast, north central, northwest. Uh, and, and the Spaniards began to uh, penetrate all these new lands, encountered new peoples who were already there. Uh, in our case, uh, mostly uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer people. But everywhere they went, they began to uh, look for mineral rich. Uh, as I said, they, they had come to America, uh, Acer America, to get rich, Acer America. Uh, and then uh, they found some incredible uh, mines, of course, uh, primarily silver. Uh, and that began to change the whole uh, world economic uh, history uh, in terms of, of what we call the Atlantic world economy. And of course, Spain would be dominant for a considerable period of time. Uh, in any case, uh, this excited other people. It will look here uh, in the next frame, please. Uh, if, and and so uh, some some of the early colonial settlers to America, uh, as I said, uh, uh, they uh, begin to think. Uh, well, there's other things to do. Uh, there's so much land here. Let's let's settle it, colonize it. Uh, and so we have uh, this continuing evolution of what the Spaniards call gobiernos. Uh, and uh, uh, some of these men uh, literally made formal contracts uh, with the king, uh, Carvajal, Luis de Carvajal, for example. He said, I want to go to this area uh, in, the, in this uh, frontier. And he said, as it, it's, he gave it uh, the name of Nuevo Leon. Uh, and uh, he collects uh, settlers uh, in 1570s. Uh, uh, they arrived. Uh, I believe it was two ships of settlers from Northwest Spain in the area border in Portugal. And so we have this entrada into Nuevo Leon. They find very little mineral riches and instead end up enslaving most of the uh, hunter-gatherer people, selling them to miners in, in the mining country to the south and southwest of Coahuila. Uh, Coahuila itself uh, had been settled uh, about the same time, maybe five, six years earlier than Nuevo Leon. Uh, just a few years earlier. Uh, and of course, uh, 
you know, the, they, they had gone into the areas to the north and west of Coahuila, which became known as uh, Vizcaya, Nueva Vizcaya. Uh, like in English America, the Spaniards, uh, you know, renamed all these places uh, in honor of their homeland. Uh, and so uh, these early entradas uh, then, uh, as I say, uh, they began to occupy the land and intrude into Native American communities. Uh, and of course, the Spaniards uh, uh, did horrible things everywhere they went, basically. Uh, but they uh, dispossess uh, Native American people from the better lands in the river valleys and pushed them out to uh, more difficult places, um, fought those that were quote, belligerent, uh, and killed many of them. But in the end, you know, disease more than anything else began to, uh, to, to bring about a great depopulation of Native American people uh, throughout uh, uh, Middle America. Uh, next frame, please. Uh, and so uh, when they went into the area where they're now, uh, you know, Monterrey and north of Monterrey, they were very close to the Rio Grande and some of the settlements there but it didn't survive. Uh, they didn't survive there and the settlers went to Saltillo. The reason for that is Carvajal got involved with, uh, as I said, his men were enslaving Native Americans. And then uh, when he was uh, brought to Mexico City, they, they started an investigation. They find out that he and others were probably had hidden some of their Jewish ancestry. And so uh, then the Inquisition got involved and, and, and the colony failed. Nuevoland failed. Uh, but the settlers that uh, survived went to live in, in Saltillo, and, and so they merged with, with the Castellanos, right, the Castilians. And, and so, you know, there's a whole big question, you know, what is the Jewish, uh, Sephardic Jewish ancestry of, of Nuevo Leon? Well, you know, if, if you look at the historical evidence, they, uh, they may have been Jewish two or three generations before they came, uh, and they may have hidden some of that uh, knowledge and religious beliefs and practices, and, and then in, it's going to basically dissipate, right? But there's a continuing uh, heritage of the, of the Sephardic Jews of, of Nuevo Leon. So that left Texas and the Seno Mexicano is another name for the Gulf Coast. Uh, and when the French arrived with La Salle, uh, Spain immediately determined they had to uh, find La Salle settlement, which eventually they did find it. Uh, uh, but, you know, practically everyone had been, had died except for a few uh, boys and uh, one, a girl, I think, a sister, one of the boys that had survived and then they were rescued by the Spaniards. Uh, and so uh, Spain says, well, let's occupy Texas. And so they, they occupy Texas, 1690s, short lived. They go back to their base in Coahuila. Uh, and so Coahuila is a mother of Texas. Coahuila is the mother of Spanish Texas. That's the way the Spaniards will come into Texas. Uh, and that left the area below Texas all the way to Tampico unoccupied. And this is part of what they call the Seno Mexicano. And today we would call it the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, uh, and so in the next frame, I talk a little bit about uh, how uh, you know, eventually they're going to occupy this section, unoccupied land. They're going to name the, the Gobierno Nuevo Santander. This is a map of Nuevo Santander. You can see that the borders were undetermined early on. In 1805, the king said, no, no, let's put the border there at the Nueces River. So you can see that originally Nuevo Santander was a, a larger gobierno. Uh, and it was uh, basically went all the way to the Medina River, right below present day uh, San Antonio. Uh, in any case, uh, the uh, Spanish government and, and the viceroy, the king and the viceroy, uh, began to deliberate, how, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, we have to occupy this land. There were pressing imperial rivalries, uh, not with the French anymore, but with the British who had occupied, uh, taken over Jamaica from Spain in 1650. And that really scared uh, the Spaniards. They believed that the British would drive through what they call the canal, separating Cuba from the peninsula of Yucatan, drive to this coastal land and go into the mining country. And, 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 and they're afraid that, you know, they, they would lose control of, of territory, right? So, so they have to occupy this. Uh, next frame. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's uh, in the discussion, 
And when you look at the discussion that's held by the, uh, the Viceroy in Mexico City, representing the king and then the king in Spain, you know, and they look at all these options and say, we have to occupy, we have to colonize this Seno Mexicano. Uh, and, uh, and so there's imperial reasons, religious reasons, and there's also personal reasons. The vecinos, the vecinos are pobladores. Uh, they want more land. They want, uh, and you know, they know there's more land beyond Monterrey, beyond Cerralvo in Nuevo León. There's more land beyond uh, the valleys in southern Nuevo León, uh, and and they're venturing into the new 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 lands. Primarily, these are are ranchers and and hacienda owners. Uh, in fact, hacienda owners were were coming uh, for a number of months periodically from central Mexico to Nuevo León. Uh, as early as the early 1600s. It's an annual uh, way of, of, uh, of uh, the movement of the sheep herds. It's very large sheep haciendas. Uh, so there's a lot of people who have an interest in, uh, in this uh, unsettled lands. And, and there's competing proposals. Uh, and this is where Escandón is selected. Next frame. Uh, and so uh, Escandón was born in 1700 and died 70 years later. Uh, again, you know, it's a bureaucracy. The, the Spanish system was a, a bureaucracy, you know, very top, you know, from the top down. Uh, and as I say, there were, there were a couple of proposals, uh, uh, one from ex-governor of Nuevo Leon, another one from a famous uh, poblador in Nuevo Leon, Antonio Ladron de Guevara, who later collaborated with Escandón uh, in the colonization in Nuevo Santander. Uh, Escandón uh, was 15 years old when he left Spain, northern Spain, and uh, uh, served uh, in the military as a cadet, and then uh, apparently fought in some uh, battles in, in that area, in Yucatan, in that area, and then he moved to Querétaro. Querétaro and Puebla were the two most important uh, textile manufacturing centers of New Spain, uh, and uh, uh, he married uh, there, his first wife, married his first wife, and she died, and she, he married again. Uh, and, and so the children, he, he had children with his, his second wife, uh, and those are going to be the children that will, uh, at least for a short period, will, will also carry the title of nobility that the king will award him uh, for his work. Uh, Escandón, uh, uh, in... And his marriages, evidently, um, basically what the historians uh, say is that, you know, he was married into uh, the upper class elites in New Spain. Uh, they had wealth. And uh, eventually he owned a textile mill in Querétaro uh, that employed at least a thousand workers, if maybe more than that. Uh, and uh, with his own money, uh, he made entradas into a large, uh, very high mountain district northeast of Querétaro, known as a Sierra Gorda, this Sierra Gorda. Uh, and the Native American people there, uh, they have special names, right? Uh, those folks uh, were very warlike from the, from the Europeans' perspective. Uh, and as Canon went, and they had been uh, Christianized, or I should say the, the missionization program, they had had Dominicans and, and Augustinians, and, and, and now the Franciscans had come. A third group had come, and they're having a really difficult time. So Escandón, in the early 1740s, with his own money and his own men, and he supplies uh, equipment, goes into the Sierra Gorda uh, four different times, four different entradas, and he subdues the Native Americans there and moves them into missions, uh, rearranges missions, set up uh, you know, Indian pueblos, for Indians, uh, Native American people, uh, and, and reports to the Viceroy, you know, this is what I've done. Well, uh, the Viceroy at this time was a very important Viceroy, one of the most important in New Spain, uh, Revilla Guiguero, the first count of Revilla Guiguero, that's his formal name. Uh, and he uh, comes to the att attention of the Viceroy. The Viceroy had a advisory committee uh, that recommended to him, you know, they, they looked at the proposals. Antonio Ladron de Guevara actually went to Spain and lobbied. The king told him, well, yeah, you know, okay, go back to Mexico City, tell the viceroy that, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm all for you. 
been selected. He wasn't selected uh, because one of the advisors uh, to Riviera Guillermo told him that La Ronda Guevara was, uh, uh, had uh, gone into Indian villages in the frontier and he had left children everywhere he went. Uh, I'm not sure that was really true, but uh, that was one of the reasons he wasn't selected. But, but really the main reason he wasn't selected was that Ascandon uh, was a man of wealth. He had a lot of money. Uh, he had a lot of prestige. Uh, and, uh, and he was a military man. He was a colonel in the, in the military and commander of the forces at Querétaro. So Scandon is selected to lead the colonization project. Next frame. Uh, and uh, he's going to uh, then uh, devise a plan. And his plan was to first do a reconnaissance of the territory. Uh, and he uh, writes to the governors in the frontier, including Texas. And, and uh, the viceroy says to, to every governor, the, gov the viceroy writes to the governor says, you have to help Escandon carry out my commission, right? Uh, to the letter. And, and so even Texas uh, sent a, an expedition down to the Rio Grande Valley. And there was a military reconnaissance in 47, 48. And as Candon wrote a report, he told the, the viceroy, uh, look, I, I, uh, we have uh, traversed all the territory. We know where we're going to go. Uh, I'm not going to need a lot of money. He says, I only need 150,000 pesos. Uh, and uh, because the, the people that are going to go and settle the, the, the new territory are going to be soldier families, right? Uh, well, who were they? Well, they, they were all Españoles, right? Everyone is Español. Uh, now, what that meant was that, you know, in terms of their language, religion, and culture, uh, they were Españoles. Most of them were uh, American-born Spaniards or Mestizos and uh, other groups of people that join the colonization project. But again, he, he, has, uh, he has to coordinate this from his home at Querétaro, right? Uh, and as I say, he, he, he plans it all out. So he, he's very much uh, in line with the Enlightenment. This is a planned out uh, colonization. And the Viceroy and, and the advisors uh, all support him because uh, they want to move away from the previous uh, uh, program of setting up uh, expensive presidios all over the place and missions. And, and so they're very more a civilian, uh, a civilian enterprise. Uh, all of these uh, settlers uh, were all multi-generation American people, Americanos, as they said, they were Americanos, right? Uh, of course, the local people, uh, Covoltecan people, now we think there were different groups of Covoltecans. Uh, these were small hunter-gatherer people and in some places, they generally assisted uh, the Spaniards as they're moving into uh, to this new uh, land, this Seno Mexicano. Uh, and so, you know, all these settlers, uh, you know, they're not getting off a boat uh, on the coast. They, they, these are multi-generation people. Uh, some of them had arrived in New Spain, you know, in 1500s. Uh, quite a number of the settlers, uh, when you look at the biographies that have been done of the settlers in Nuevo Leon, you know, most of them arrived in late 1500s, middle 1500s, early 1600s. Very few, very few arrive in the late uh, 1800s. Generally, those are, I'm sorry, 1700s. Those are officials uh, and um, missionaries and religious people that come from uh, Europe to America. Next frame. Uh, and so, uh, this is uh, Scandon's uh, second wife. Uh, uh, I, you know, I've never seen this firsthand. I got it from a book published there in Mexico. Uh, as I said, she came from a wealthy family, uh, and they had several children. Uh, I want to mention this: uh, not going into their children, except for one, uh, a son named uh, well, one son, Mariano, uh, was a priest, and he became an officer at the cathedral. Uh, in Michoacan and died in 1814. Uh, and then uh, uh, another son, Manuel de Escandón, I want to mention Manuel de Escandón. Uh, his son, Manuel de Escandón, uh, was uh, interim governor at times. You know, when the governor would leave, they would leave someone in their place. Uh, and then uh, he was a soldier like his father, uh, also a colonel uh, in the military. Uh, and uh, he uh, was uh, 
1772, he was interim governor of Texas. He, he was uh, commissioned by the Viceroy to resolve some uh, problems. Uh, there were some issues in Texas dealing with a governor of the state, Manuel Munoz, who was being investigated. And so, you know, he was under investigation. So, but Manuel Escandon serves as governor like his father uh, for about 10 years, dies in, in um, uh, 1800. Uh, next frame, please. Uh, and so uh, what, what do they do? Well, in the Escandon era, because he, he's going to be removed from power. Uh, so the settlers uh, that are recruited, uh, some are given a small stipend. Many of them come with their own property, their families and their own property. Rarely did they bring any slaves. Uh, occasionally they brought some people that they call uh, sirvientes servants, right? Uh, but these were, uh, that is, most of the people that were recruited uh, to settle in the new towns were uh, rancheros, uh, a few artisans. They were mostly rancheros. They're not hacendados. Now, there were a few hacendados uh, in the older cities uh, like Querétaro and San Miguel el Grande, which is San Miguel Allende, and, and some of them participated in, in, in founding some of the town settlements because, you know, they had so much wealth, they had already moved. Uh, their herds and animals there. They didn't live there, but they had their servants there. Uh, they, so they set up these small towns, 30, 40, 50, 60 families at the beginning, right? And they were called uh, vias, as they were never called pueblos. Uh, and then they would, in some places, uh, they founded missions. Again, the Franciscans were assigned. These are all, in the beginning, it's communal land, except for some individuals who received title, uh, title to property to land uh, by Escandon or some other government official. Uh, Jose Vasquez Orrego below Laredo, for instance, uh, gets about 200,000 acres and sets up Dolores, which was supposed to be a town, but it's a complex of, uh, of three uh, ranchos. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, settlers had discovered the salt lakes uh, since about 1650 or so. And they uh, also uh, used the Native Americans to uh, mine the salt and for their own use and for sale in the different uh, neighboring areas. In 1757, there was a formal inspection of the colony. They wanted to know how it was doing. As Canon said that he had finished his work, uh, he really hadn't, but uh, he began to have problems because uh, a new viceroy came in and the viceroy didn't like him, all right? Revilla Guiguedo, uh, after I finished my book, I, I did more research, I find out that uh, Revilla Guiguedo uh, was from the same province as Jose de Escandon. That is, they were uh, paisanos. I'm, I'm sure that Escandon, I mean, they didn't know each other when uh, at, at any earlier point, uh, because, you know, Escanon was, uh, you know, uh, hijo Hidalgo, right? He was from, from, from the gentleman class, the lower class, uh, the lowest class of nobility, so to speak. Uh, and Revilla Guiguedo were, were actually noble people. And uh, in fact, he, he will have a son who will also be a viceroy uh, a little bit later on. So the uh, next uh, frame. Uh, and so in this formal... Uh, uh, this is uh, an 1803 uh, painting done by a local official in Nuevo Santander of, of one of the towns, a mining town. This became the second capital of Nuevo Santander, right? An next frame. Uh, and, uh, and, and so you have a Royal Commission and the Royal Commission in 57 says people are doing well. Some of them are getting wealthy uh, by the standards of the day. Uh, especially with the salt trade. Uh, and they said, you know, they have to pay taxes, you know. Uh, Escanon recruited them, and under the standard laws of, New of Spain, uh, they had law books, and they said that for 10 years, if you went into a, a non-conquered area, you have no taxes, you pay no taxes for 10 years, no taxes to the government, and no tax to the church, uh, the 10% tax, the tithe. Uh, so, uh, complaints uh, went to the viceroy that didn't like Escandon, and they said, you know, he's a thief, he's a mal, mal administration of the colony, he's become extremely wealthy, 
Uh, other people said he appointed uh, people who were criminals to office. Uh, and uh, the missionaries had major complaints. They said, he doesn't care about us. He only cares about the civilians. He's never been good to us and helpful to us. Uh, and then the settlers as a whole, some of them wrote and, and appeared before this commission, this powerful commission, two-member commission, went to every town. Uh, and they said, we, we don't have our own land. We were promised our own land, our own, our own land, and, and we have communal land. So... The, the vice always tells the commission, you have to go to every town, take all the complaints, set up formally the town, set up the missions, and award the land to the settlers. And, and demand taxes, right? They have to start paying uh, their fair share. The next one. Uh, next. Uh, this is, uh, and there's an excellent book by Galen Greaser, who was at the General Land Office. And he has all these uh, maps of the towns in the valley, not all of the towns in Nuevo Santander. And this is Camargo. Camargo was the most important town in the valley uh, for a good number of years. Uh, I, I say, you're from the valley, you may hear me say it's La Reina del Valle, right? This is the, the layout of the Porciones, these narrow strips of land, about 6,000 acres, all of them having uh, frontage on the river. The next frame, uh, and, and so this is a letter from the son-in-law of Jose de Escandon to the Viceroy in 1790 or 92, where he says, I want to, uh, I want to quit uh, being administrator of, of the state monopoly. Uh, I can answer any questions. And there's a monopoly on, uh, on uh, tobacco, gunpowder, uh, salt, and uh, playing cards and uh, stamped paper. And he was a, a trusted uh, right-hand person to uh, Jose de Escandon. Next frame, um, uh, that's his signature there, 1792. And you can see on here, this is to the second count there at the bottom uh, to Senor Conde Revilla Viguedo, the second count, the son of the, of the first man. The next one. Uh, and so, you know, this colony was prosperous uh, because the settlers brought in a lot of livestock. Ranchero society, uh, very few cases, uh, larger folks had administrators. They did have foremen. Uh, and of course, they had men that worked uh, with the animals themselves. Generally, uh, these are uh, free workers, uh, but they call them sirvientes, right? And then there were a few other workers or specialized workers, uh, arrieros. Uh, work with the mule trains that carried, for example, wool. Uh, and then you had uh, uh, craftsmen, the albañiles. Uh, the next frame. Uh, and then they also awarded, besides those narrow strips, these are actual land grants, Mercedes de Tierra. Uh, these are Spanish land grants. And you can see uh, there doesn't seem to be a pattern to them. Uh, but in, in the period after 1821, it all got filled up to the Nueces River with what we call the, the Mexican land grants, right? Tierras and Mercedes means land grants. Next one. Uh, here's the, uh, this is a survey map of one of those Spanish land grants of Salvador del Tule. It's located just a few miles to the north of Edinburgh. It's a very large uh, land grant. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, uh, with this new commission, they have to pay their, their tax, uh, the diezmo, uh, sales tax, average 4 to 6%. And then there's a monopoly on, on all these products that they have to buy through agents uh, of the king, right? In every colony, there would be agents. Uh, the merchant in Camargo, Reynosa, would have to buy the tobacco from the local merchant, right? Mer uh, I'm sorry, agent. And I did find a, a couple of sheets on the tax records just to give you an idea, a next frame. Uh, in the next frame, please. Uh, okay, the uh, the ESMOS, uh, I, this is very interesting, folks. Just to give you an idea, uh, these are uh, tithe collections to the church, 36,000 pesos. And, and here they have, a, in this accounting, they separate the towns in the north of the lower valley, the Vias del Norte. And you can see how, uh, you know, they not collecting a lot of money in terms of money, uh, you know, it grow, go, goes up uh, from 2,800 to 4,000, you know, in one year, there are 76 to 77. 
if you'll see the next slide, uh, I, I, I like this slide because uh, this is 1799, folks. And if you look at all the collection districts uh, for the Diocese of, of Monterrey, you'll see that the, the most important collection district uh, is the Valley, Villas del Norte, 16,892 pesos. The second most important district was Saltillo. It is, that it is the Valley town surpass Saltillo in wealth somewhere in the 1790s, okay? Uh, and then if you look at Texas, Texas was very Dr. poor. Ponder, we, um, we're, at, we're at five minutes left, sir, so you can sum up. Yes, I will. Uh, and so here I merely wanted you to see, you know, this is one way of, 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 of gauging wealth, right? Uh, this is, these are rancheros. I mean, this is where the wealth is coming from. Uh, and the collector gets a, uh, you know, he gets a, a percentage of, uh, when he collects the goods and he sells them, he has to give the money to the bishop in Monterrey. And he's allowed, uh, I think, 6% of the sales, right? This is a beautiful uh, counting records. Uh, there are uh, copies in Monterrey and some are available, available at UT. In the next frame, uh, please, uh, uh, this is the uh, front page of the sales tax. Alcavala is a sales tax, uh, Libro Real, 1781. I only found two. I've been looking for more economic data, and this is one way to look at it, uh, economic data. The next frame, uh, and these are collectors. Uh, I forget which year this is. Uh, 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 in, uh, I don't think I can see it here. Maybe maybe it's cut off at the bottom of the page. But these are the individual towns and the individual collectors and the amount of the sales tax that was collected. And then they're also paid a certain percentage uh, for the uh, based on, on how much they collected, right? Of course, this one goes to the Viceroy, whereas the ESMO goes to the Bishop in Monterrey. The next one... Uh, so basically what I'm saying is, is they needed to find the right person at the right time. They found the right person. There were a lot of complaints. Uh, the second vice Roy Kreutz didn't like Escandon, uh, and neither did the merchant class, the powerful merchant class in Mexico City, because Escandon had a small port at Soto La Marina. He had a boat built, two boats, and he carried trade, uh, and they, they hated that. He was, you know, uh, cutting into their monopoly. Uh, and so the right man at the right time, he gave everything he could. Uh, he is investigated. Uh, after he dies, Escandon died, not realizing that the king cleared him of all charges against him uh, two years after his death. Uh, what did the Escandon settlement mean? What did it mean for the lower valley and the wider uh, area of the colony? Well, uh, implementation of ranching, right? Hispanic ranching. Uh, the beginning of trade and commerce in this new land, uh, contacts with the larger towns and cities to the south and west, uh, you know, regional economy, there's connections to a regional economy, there's participation in the Atlantic world economy, uh, and um, uh, also uh, the settlers, as I said, were very experienced frontier people, uh, and they came and they uh, uh, implanted uh, their, uh, you know, costumbres, uh, religion, uh, and so we have a society, a Hispanic society and culture take root uh, that, you know, all of us uh, know that, you know, we still have a, a continued legacy. Okay, very Thank good. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alonso, we're going to have to stop because they, the next session will be coming in here in nine minutes. So we, we have a, thank you so much, a very, very engaging talk presentation. Uh, I think uh, you raised a lot of good points here and probably a few things to say for Q&A. Does um, anyone have any questions? Um, we have a question here from a former teacher or teacher. Thank you, doctor. I have like 10 questions, so I'll try and keep it short. Uh, when you said that the uh, they came in through the Eastern Corridor, does that mean through uh, Veracruz? when they first came into uh, uh, Nuevo Santander? Uh, no, the, the folks to Nuevo Santander, uh, I took this idea, you know, didn't explain it, obviously, 
uh, Bolton, who's the father of the Spanish borderland, said if you look at their movement of the Spaniards after the famous mining discoveries, uh, one group goes towards the east, uh, towards San Luis Potosí, Saltillo, about the same time, 1560s or so, uh, and then Carvajal uh, to the east of that, right, north and east, Nuevo León, and then Texas, I mean, uh, Texas later, 1690s, much later. So that's the Eastern Corridor. Now, the folks that, that they're coming from Europe to America, uh, normally they would come to Veracruz, but uh, I think I think uh, uh, I think Carvajal's uh, folks. I think they they came through Tampico. I, you know, I think that's where they came through. Then they, what I'm saying, they get to the coast. They I just have to go overland. Uh, in fact, he he said that he had uh, uh, cleared the road of all Native Americans. He said they were like their enemies, and that's what he claimed. Of course, that was not true, right? Uh, but um, in any case, that's the Eastern Corridor. Okay. And when you say that the porciones that were established by Escandón, they were uh, north of the Rio Grande or uh, on either side of the river when they were no, no. establishing? No, the, the, the Rio Grande is a river, folks. The Rio Grande doesn't divide uh, anything. Right, back then. Uh, the Rio Grande, the, 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 folk, the towns, all of the towns were on the south side, so they could see the, the enemy coming from the north, okay, except for Laredo. They couldn't put Laredo on the south side because they, they discovered that Laredo, the south side was too much lower in elevation, lower in elevation than the north side. They had to have a lookout, right? right. And uh, that's the other thing. That's why Reynosa was not put right on the mouth of the river. Right. You don't want your enemy coming in at the mouth of the river and then you're all dead, right? So, so that's why Reynosa, the rest of the towns on the river was inland from the river. Okay. And, and when you say the Rio Grande Valley, you're talking about south of Laredo, the lower counties that now consist of well, the lower counties. You know, there's a lot of confusion. Let me see if I can clarify it real shortly. Uh, that is, the, the Spaniards never used the valley of the Rio Grande. They never said Rio Grande Valley, all right? Everywhere the Spaniards went, uh, they, they often took their censuses as, as, as censuses in river valleys. Why? There are Mediterranean people that have to be by rivers to survive, right? Uh, and so that's how they do it. Now, when 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 I say the valley, that's the north. That's the new word that uh, Americanos, North Americanos, Gringos that came in in the war with Mexico. The Gringos began to write, and they said we're at the valley of the Rio Grande, right? And so there's a document in, in the Library of Congress uh, where somebody wrote anonymously. Uh, his, the, the Valley of the Rio Grande, 1848 or so, right? So the Spanish term is Vías del Norte. And as Candón said, all the valley towns from Laredo down to Reynosa and later Matamoros, those are the Vías del Norte. So Matamoros is the baby of the towns in the Vías del Norte. That's the term that the Spaniards and the Mexicanos used, uh, you know, until, you know, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and then it became, you know, the Rio Grande and the Rio Bravo, all right? Now there's confusion. Some people say, well, you know, is, uh, they say, I'm from the Valley. And you ask them, say, well, I'm from Corpus Christi, right? So, you know, there's a lot of confusion, right? But uh, normally uh, that is, that's a historical way of looking at it. Geographically, uh, basically, you know, the Laredo, Laredo is a little bit, uh, you know, it's in the lower part of the Rio Grande and then be above that, I would say, is the middle Rio Grande. But that's in geographical terms, okay? Okay, we're, uh, looks like we're at a, totally out of time. Um, I'm, they gave me the X, which means we have to kind of clear so that they can bring in the next group. Thank you, Dr. Alonso, very engaging. I, I suffice to say that Escandón brought 6,000 settlers to the Texas, and right here, me too. And, uh, and, and so he may be officially the first father of Texas. And then Stephen F. Austin brings 300 settlers. So he's the father of Texas. So just for the record, that's the way it's looked in the valley. Thank you. Oh, yes, we can give you some information about Dr. Alonso. So thank you, um, thank you again for all of you for attending. Sorry we were out of time, but um, very good.